Hello, and welcome to the Brutal Iron Jam Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast number 1,953. The topic is in-depth. The title is Trainer Education Exercise Selection Discussion. One of my business clients is a personal trainer. We are creating personalized workout templates, and they're learning how to manipulate the template to better select individual specific exercises. What they want to have is when anyone walks in the door, they want to have a predetermined structure that they know would work well, but they want to know how to modify that structure either in the structural components and or the exercise selection so that it best matches the individual client's needs. What they're looking for is a way to create great programming but be able to make it up on the fly. (laughs) And this is going to help them. Their current, one of their current issues is paralysis by analysis is they sit and hand write each workout for each client that they have each day and it's just absolutely crushing their time and they're over analyzing it a little bit they are they're kind of losing like the forest for the trees kind of thing sometimes they show me some of the workouts i'm like wow this is really detailed and very good in this one area but you completely forgot this one concept and they're like oh crap (laughs) so um we're working to find a template that hits all areas gives them a known structure but does allow for that personalization so this is what the game we're playing with and i thought it would be fun to kind of share uh, that in a podcast now the workout templates that i gave them specifically we're starting with these because it matches their client needs is we have a full body workout with an upper body focus and then we have a full body workout with a lower body focus for right now, they train most people two times per week, so they like to do an upper body focused one and then a lower body focused one, but there are elements that they want to focus on in each workout. They don't want it to be like an exclusively a leg day and then a whole upper body day and not have the ability to double up on some concepts or kind of carry something through from session to session. So for example, let's say that the person is really struggling to pick up the technique of an exercise. They would like to be able to include that exercise in both workouts. So they can cover that exercise twice a week. But they don't want to lose the elements that they need for the remaining part of the workouts uh, just to get in that one repeated movement. So, uh, a basic example of this would be is, let's say the person doesn't quite understand how to do lateral raises. We don't want to spend one session spending a lot of time on lateral raises then the next session spending a lot of time on ladder races, but yet we haven't done the quadriceps, the hamstrings, the glutes, the core, the back, the chest. The, you know, like they want to make sure they get everything else in. So we want to have enough structure that we get all the other elements in, but enough leeway to allow them to uh, do specialized education or repeat an exercise. Like there's just a lot of variables that would need to be included in order for it to be great sessions for their clients. So I'm going to read you through the template that we have. Uh, I I do understand that this can be a little bit challenging via auditory stimulus. Uh, So I do understand that, but I want you to think of just the concepts of what I'm talking about today. Don't try to necessarily write everything down. (laughs) Uh, More so think through the concepts. The first part of the workout is a movement prep circuit. We have podcast 1,112 titled The Best Warm-Up Routine. You can find older podcasts by going to our website, www.brutalirongym.com. We have a podcast player on the homepage right underneath that player. It has instructions on how to find older podcasts. So depending on how how far back your platform goes, you might not be able to get back to podcast 1,112. The one on our website only goes back 300 episodes, so you can use those instructions on how to find older podcasts. But that podcast, 1,112, will explain the the movement prep circuit, kind of the warm-up of the workout in greater detail. But what we want to do, and you can do these in any order, you can combine one or two of the movements into a single movement, but we want to do something that addresses hip mobility and strengthening, something that addresses core bracing and strengthening, and something that addresses thoracic mobility and strengthening, which is kind of like the shoulder health. So something for hips, core, and shoulders. We want to have that in there. Now, they have sets and you know, time and retention ranges, but let's just 
avoid that for a second because I'm going to focus on exercise selection. Then they have the strength circuit, which we also could call the main circuit of the workout. For the upper body day, they have a pull muscle, a pull muscles exercise and a push muscles exercise that they're going to superset back and forth. The pull muscles are essentially your back. Any kind of back movement is probably going to include the rear delts and biceps to some degree. Then the push muscles are our chest, shoulders, and triceps. Any chest press is going to include the chest and the triceps, some shoulder maybe. An overhead press is going to be shoulders for sure and triceps and very little chest. So you do have to kind of alternate a little bit uh, in those workouts to make sure you've covered all of the areas. So for their pull muscle exercises, I have them alternating per program. So if they do a brand new workout with a client every week, then they alternate every week. If they repeat the same workout for a couple weeks in a row to learn the technique, to make some progressions, and then when they make a brand new exercise, they would rotate. But we want to rotate through horizontal and vertical exercises. So for pull muscles, that's basically pull-ups and pull-downs and rows. There's a lot of in-between angles depending on what machines you have available and what type of exercises you like. But we're essentially looking for something that's uh, kind of a, a horizontal, you can think of it as perpendicular to the body, and then something that's parallel with the body. The idea is just to change around the angles. We want to make sure that we're not always doing only rows or always only doing pull-ups or pull-downs. We want to change up the angles quite a bit to make sure there'll be a full development of the back in all the different areas. Now, that'll also lead into shoulder health and shoulder stability. So it's also important for variety for that sake. Then pull muscles, we're going to alternate between horizontal and vertical, which would be essentially chest presses and then overhead presses. Uh, there's a lot of variances in there, but that's essentially what we're looking for. Then we have an accessory circuit, kind of the ending circuit. We're going to do something for core and then something for a full body, fun, weird movement. That's a chance for them to throw in just... Anything interesting for the client, they want to do battle ropes, they want to flip tires, they want to push and pull a sled, um, a Turkish get-ups, do something with landmine, whatever whatever crazy fun stuff you want to make the person do, TRX things, uh, whatever it might be, that's usually a good place to put that. And we usually do some type of uh, core exercise. Now, core is essentially your, like your, it's not just your six-pack, like the rectus abdominis, muscles. We want to think of uh, the obliques, the lower back, think of hip positioning, hip stability. So I include a lot of anti-movement exercises as core work. That would be, think of like variations of carries, where you have a weighted resistance that's trying to twist you or bend you or fold you, but the muscles in the midsection around the spine like between your hips and your rib cage, they're all firing to hold you in position. So we do a lot of anti-movement, and then when we do movement, we don't think of just you know crunches. We want to think of rotational movements as well. So it's mixing up a lot of the stimulus, which can be an, an anti-movement can be a stimulus as well as as much as a movement can be a stimulus. As, so it's good to mix that in. Now that's their workout for upper body focus. For lower body, same movement prep, something for hips, core, and shoulders. Then the main circuit, the strength circuit, is some type of knee bend, like squat type thing, and then some type of deadlift or hinge movement. And then the accessory circuit is still core and a full body crazy weird fun stuff. So that format is excellent because anybody that they face uh, any, any, not that they face like a combat with, combat with uh, but any client that they work with, this, this format would work great for anyone. Any age, any goal, literally anyone can benefit from these sections. You have something that prepares you to move for the day, that works on hip uh, and shoulder health and mobility, as well as core strength. Why the hell would that not be good for anybody, right? Of course. Then strength stuff is good for anyone. I've trained people for, you know, Ironmans, ultra marathons, all the endurancey type stuff you could possibly think of. And strength is extremely important for even those athletes. Um, strength is kind of, you can think of it as if they want to have endurance, they want something to last a long time. What is the something? Meaning if I want to run for a long time, what am I 
What am I starting with and I'm slowly depleting over time? And that would be kind of like strength. That would be the capacity of what the body can do. You want to increase the capacity of what the body can do so that way you can do it for longer. Uh, it's a very generic way of explaining it, but strength increases the original capacity, the thing that you have to then draw out over time. So it would be very helpful for any runner or any endurance person, like cyclist, whatever, swimmer, to have strong hips, strong shoulders, strong core and midsection. Strength is never a weakness, as Mark Bell says. Uh, that's a good quote. Uh, so strength is never a weakness. That's definitely something you always want to work on. And it makes sense if we're doing upper body, you can divide the upper body muscles essentially into push and pull muscles. I know the mid delts might be a weird exercise and, you know, do they push, do they pull, who knows. There's some nuances uh, in there, but uh, push and pull is a pretty good way of, base, of breaking down the upper body. And then the lower body, think of where am I bending? <laughs> am I bending at the hip or am I bending at the knee or a combination of both? Typically, most movements are going to have one bending more than the other. So we're going to count that as towards that. So if I have squats, if I have somebody with, um, you know, long femur, long torso, they might have a high degree of hip hinge uh, bending at their squat. So we're going to count that as a hinge. Whereas if I have somebody with very short femurs, they're going to have a very uprighted torso while they squat. I'm going to count that more towards a knee bend. So I do personalize the way in which I categorize each person, each client, based on how they move. So that's very important to know, and it's it's okay to allow that. Uh, but, for example, an RDL or a stiff leg deadlift, that's a hinge. Your knees might bend some, but the overwhelming majority of the movement is coming from the hips. Then, conversely, think of a walking lunge or a step up. The overwhelming majority of the movement is coming from a bend at the knee, not at the hips. So that would count as a knee bend or a squat variation. So those are the categories. Let's go on now and let's think of exercise selection considerations. For a movement prep circuit, the thing we start with, one of the things I immediately think of is, do I want the person to be on the ground or not? The reason why is some people have mobility issues. You know, if somebody has a mobility issue, making them get down onto the ground and then have to get up off the ground can be very challenging. Whether it's mobility issues, maybe even blood pressure issues, maybe body size. Maybe they're just really kind of overweight and they got a big belly on them. It's like they're not going to want to climb down onto the ground, climb back up, you know. So being mindful of the positioning of the exercises is something I immediately think of when I'm starting to kind of write the movement prep circuit. Do I want them on the ground or not? And again, that can be mobility issues, blood pressure issues, body size issues, also personality type. I had a client tell me one time uh, they were like a tactical athlete, and they were like, I hate stuff where I have to lay on the ground. It just doesn't feel athletic. I don't, I don't feel like an athlete if my feet aren't on the ground. And I was like, okay, awesome, let's do it. Uh, because why would I, I don't need to argue with them. In no way whatsoever would I want to make them do something they don't want to do. And they don't have to do it. You can do any warm-up that you do on the ground. You can probably do some variation of it standing. Uh, some clients, though, it is better to get them down on the ground. Maybe there are certain exercises that I know would work really well for them, and it does involve uh, being down on the ground, whether they're laying on the back, laying on the belly, whether they're in a half-kneeling position, quadruped position, whatever it might be. I also then... In my exercise selection, I pay attention to if I'm making them get down on the ground, I only want to make them do that once. I personally, and this could be because I'm lazy, but I personally hate if I would have to get down on the ground to do one exercise, get back up to do another exercise, get down on the ground to do an exercise, get back up to do another exercise. It's annoying as hell. Just if I'm on the ground, I'm going to do all the ground things. If I'm up standing, I'm going to do all the standing things. <laughs> so I am very aware of that when I program for clients is do I have them in a position then that they can kind of streamline and stay within. So if we do a half kneeling exercise, I'm going to have them stay with that kind of half kneeling or maybe even into a quadruped position. If I have them laying on their belly, I'm not going to make them roll over to the back, then back over to the belly, then back over to the back, then back over to the belly. None of that stuff. Don't make people do that. 
no one's going to like that. And that's also part of the reason why people hate stretching and doing all these warm-up stuff is because of all those stupid little nuancey annoyances. No one wants to get down the ground, get back up the ground, down the ground, all that stuff. So be very mindful of that when you're picking exercises, that if they're going to be down, keep them down. <laughs> if they're up, they're, keep them up. And pay attention to the fact of whether people should be down the ground or not. Again, mobility, blood pressure, body size, uh, personality type. Then, in the three exercises that I would think to focus on, which is, again, hip mobility, core strengthening, then th thoracic mobility, which is like shoulders, I think to myself, well, what does this person kind of need the most? If they're coming at me with a shoulder, an old shoulder injury, I want to focus on improving range of motion in the shoulder, improving stabilizational awareness and control of the shoulder, and then getting blood flow into the shoulder, trying to help uh, bring in new blood, bring in new proteins, get some, get some challenge to the tissues, but in a, a manageable and appropriate challenge type way. I'm not going to make them do something crazy heavy or very uh, abnormal, odd positioning if, it, if I think it might you know, cause their shoulder to creak or crack or cause any like zapping, pinching pains, anything like that. So, for example, I might have them do band dislocations. If you don't know what any of the things I'm naming are, just pause the podcast or write them down and look them up later. But I would have them do band dislocations to work on range of motion. And maybe some people can't get the band up over their head, so I'm not going to make them do that. I'm just thinking of, you know, just examples. Uh, but a band dislocation and then go into what's called a mixed diagonal grip. Uh, well, a diagonal mixed grip band pull apart. And that works on shoulder stability, but the shoulders also have to move. So that's going to be awesome for postural work and teaching the shoulder which muscles brace, which muscles move. Uh, anytime we do something, there are muscles that should be holding positions and then muscles that are moving. I want them to teach their shoulders and relearn the coordination for that. Then I might have them do, say, battle ropes. <laughs> um, you can do battle ropes, uh, for example, with alternating single leg RDLs. So they stand on one leg, kind of bend a little bit at the knee, hinge at the hip, while still doing small little waves with the battle rope. Then they switch to the other leg, do that, switch to the other leg, do that, and they're going back and forth while still keeping the battle rope going. The reason why I might have them do that is we said the warm-up should include, the movement prep should include shoulders, core, and hips. Well, if I'm doing band dislocations and the mixed grip diagonal pull parts, that's just shoulders. I still got core and hips to go. So having them do battle ropes pushes the blood flow into the shoulders, but it starts to introduce core stability by having them switch from leg to leg. And it starts to introduce uh, opening up the hamstrings, opening up the adductors, kind of getting some blood flow into the lower body by alternating the RDLs. So there's a lot of ways to blend that in. You can have them do like bodyweight squats while doing battle ropes, uh, you know, like squat jumps, variations, depends on the fitness level of the client. But let's say that's a shoulder example. Let's say somebody's coming in with a lower back issue. Okay, well, in the movement prep, I want to address that issue. I'm going to work on maybe addressing tight glutes and adductors because they're probably rock solid tight to try to like protect that lower back if the lower back is weak or if the lower back is having problems because the core is weak, the abdominal strength is weak, the, the lower back is going to be locked in super tight. That's probably what's giving them the pain. To, to help keep the lower back protected, the body's going to lock the glutes up in the adductors. So we want to work on opening up and encouraging range of motion in the glutes and adductors. Then I might work on hip positioning. I want them to learn how to have a neutral hip tilt so they're not posteriorly or anteriorly rotated. And then I might want to work on core stabilization, core strength. So that way we can learn how to include the transverse abdominis, the obliques, the rectus abdominis, uh, you know, all those things into stabilizing and controlling um, lower back stabiliz stabilization and health and positioning. So that could be a sequence where we do like pigeon reach throughs. Uh, quadruped post pelvic tilts where you have them do pelvic tilts to understand uh, posterior and anterior tilts and then maybe they could do bird dog and that works on a little bit of core strengthening uh, core stabilization while working on extending an arm and a leg if they're a little more physically fit than that you can have them do planks with an alternating reach uh, so there's a lot of variations from there but that's something also if you notice they're down the ground the whole time 
So the first one we said was band dislocations, mixed grip diagonal pull parts, and battle ropes. That's all standing. The second one we said if it was a lower back issue, we were going to do pigeon reach throughs, quadruped PPTs, and then plank with alternating reach or bird dogs. That's all down the ground. And that's all your belly is facing the ground. So we're not telling them to roll over, you know, do all these other crazy things. They get into one position and they kind of do all their exercises in that kind of position. So those are some considerations that we would make when we're thinking of the movement prep. Is do I want them on the ground or standing? What do I want to focus on of the three elements, uh, hip, core, or shoulders? Is there something we want to improve and hyper-focus on within the exercises that we select to cover those areas? Then we think of a main movements. If we think of like pull muscles, the reason why I have the circuit set for the upper body where pull is the first exercise, push is the second, typically people are muscularly imbalanced to where their pull muscles are weaker than their push. So I want them to do that first in the circuit when they have the most amount of energy, they can give the most intensity to that movement. So we're going to do pull first anytime we're supersetting push and pull. When we think of pull muscles, I, like, I want to think, okay, well, what is this person's weaknesses? Do they have bad posture? Do we want to address that within our strength exercise? Maybe they have uneven muscle development. Maybe they have really big lats, but they have no mid-back. Uh, is there kind of position? Is there muscle development that we want to address? Are there positions that maybe they're not good at? So maybe they can't get their arms overhead, and that's something they struggle with. And they've said they came to you because they're like, "Oh, my posture's so bad. My shoulders always hurt." I, I really just can't have my arms overhead very long, or I noticed, you know, when I'm doing back squats, I get a lot of front shoulder pain or elbow pain. So they're they're limited in external rotation and shoulder health. So okay, am I going to pull? Am I gonna select pull exercises to help to work on that? So for example, lat pull downs with an isometric hold uh, for a two to two to three, two to four, two to five count somewhere in there, uh, where the isometric hold at the bottom is a great way to work on mentally connecting with all the back muscles and teaching them how to brace and hold their shoulders in position as they would then allow their hands to extend overhead as the weight of the exercise is pulling their hands overhead. So in a sense, it's actually a reverse overhead press. So rather than the weight pushing down on them and them having to push overhead, we can actually get them going through an overhead press mechanics where they're actually pulling the weight towards them and then resisting the weight pulling their hands up. So a lat pull down is actually a reverse overhead press. So it can actually be an easier way to get the joint into that position, get the muscles into that pathway. So that way you can actually improve their overhead press by doing lat pull downs. It also helps address if they have tight lats. Maybe part of the reason why they can't get their arms overhead is because their lats are too damn tight. So lat pull downs done with proper form. You can also do scapular depression and scapular movement type uh, lat pull downs, which can really help open up the lats. So you can choose your back exercises or your pull movements to address even other issues like shoulder mechanics and shoulder health. Then we think of, okay, what's the area of emphasis for this person? If they're a power lifter, we know that they got to have strong lats because lats are involved in all three main lifts, squat, bench, deadlift. If they're a bodybuilder, the lats tend to grow first before you get thickness of the upper back. So it's probably better in your back exercises to focus on the middle and lower traps because that will grow the mid-back and their lats will respond anyhow. So that's actually a really good key area of focus is picking back exercises that target the middle and lower traps that are still compound style movements. One of my favorite is a cable seated row with a narrow angled overhand mag grip handle. Uh, maximum advantage grip, you can look them up. Uh, great handles, they're a little expensive, but they're very, very, very good. Uh, you'll have it for life. It's like 60 bucks and you get to have it for the rest of your life, so it's not that expensive. But that's an excellent exercise to target the middle and lower traps. Then I would think of what else, are, like maybe they're a tactical athlete, first responder, straw man. Uh, what kind of, what are they going to need for that? You know, tactical athlete, a lot of pull-ups. If they're a first responder, uh, we want to have them be able to, uh, say, be able to pull something towards them and hold it in position. Like they would drag a body, <laughs> you know, out of a burning building or a house or something. Uh, so you might do isometric hold rows. Maybe you do dumbbell bent over rows with an isometric hold. And that's very specific to that person's area of, of need. 
So when I think of pool exercises, I'm going to think of, okay, what are their weaknesses? And then also what's related to what they need? Are they a power Are they a bodybuilder? Are they a tactical athlete? Are they first responder? Are they aiming for fat loss? If it's fat loss, what burns the most freaking calories? <laughs> you know, what targets the most muscles gets a lot of muscle damage. So we want something that they can do very heavy. But that's also going to burn up a lot of calories, involve a lot of muscles. So you would want to think of what is their area of need, what fits that area of need the most. Pushing exercises, same thing. What's their weakness? Do they have a dominant chest but weak shoulders or vice versa? What's their area of emphasis? Are they a power through? Going to focus on bench press more often. If they're a bodybuilder, you're looking at probably uh, slight inclined movements and you're looking for free movements. Uh, meaning I might not have them do a barbell, I'd rather have them do dumbbells. Dumbbells are going to engage a lot more stabilization muscles. They can also personalize the pathway to best target the fibers they need. So that's going to be a much better growth uh, response for them than a barbell bench press. If you think of a strongman, overhead press. Tactical athlete, overhead press. First responder, probably still overhead press. (laughs) You know, fat loss. What burns the most calories? How do I move the most amount of weight? damage the most amount of tissues, use the most amount of muscles, so I can burn the most amount of calories. If we think of squatting movements or knee bending movements, where are they weak at? You know, do their knees cave in when they walk up steps? Have them do step ups and work on not caving their knees in. (laughs) You know, if they're a power lifter, you're going to work on uh, knee strength. That's going to be the kind of squat mechanics that you're going to look for. Is How do I target the lower quadriceps down to knees? If they're... uh, You know, kind of first responder, um, you're going to look at like unilateral movements a lot rather than uh, static standing still movements. You're probably going to look at dynamic lateral, like unilateral movements. So they might be better off doing like weighted lunges. That's going to be better for them than a standard like standing squat. Doesn't mean you can't do squats, it just means trying to think of movements that can make them stronger, but they're also more applicable to what their needs are. Think of hinging mechanics or deadlift mechanics. Where are they weak? Do they have weak glutes? Try to pick something that emphasizes their glutes more so than the lower back or the hamstrings. Try to isolate into the glutes a little bit. That might be an RDL as opposed to a stiff leg deadlift. Or even a like an RDL compared to a conventional deadlift. Because you don't want to let them get the quad drive off the ground to carry the momentum through where the hamstrings and glutes should be doing the work. So an elevated deadlift or an RDL can actually be harder on the glutes. So that might be a better choice. Again, think of what are their needs. Are they a power lifter? Are they a bodybuilder? Tactical athlete? First responder? Are they a fat loss? Aging client? If it's an aging client, you want to teach them how to deadlift something that's between their feet. So you're not going to look for a conventional deadlift as much as you might look for a, a moderate stanced sumo deadlift. Think about if they have to pick up a heavy bag of mulch in the backyard. They have to pick up a, a you know, bin of laundry pick up some crap around the house. They're probably going to be standing a little bit wider stanced. They almost want to stand over top of it, hinge at their hips, bend down between their feet and pick that up. Think of ke- like deadlifting a kettlebell off the ground. That's way more applicable to the aging population than a barbell conventional deadlift. Not doesn't mean they can't do it. It's just thinking of what's the most important thing or what's the most applicable thing for that client. Core work, that's our accessory circuit. So once we go through the main circuit, core work, what's, what are they weak at? And what's most specific to what their needs are? Think of stabilization as a category, anti-rotation as a category. So pal-off, uh, any kind of pal-off hold, pal-off rotation, pal-off twist, pal-off whatever. So P-A-L-L-O-F, you can search for those variations. Those are great for anti-rotation. You can think of actual rotational drills. I do a lot of rotational drills with athletes. I've worked with a lot of pitchers. We do a ton of rotational drills. We also do a ton of anti-rotation because that helps build the stabilization and support for what shouldn't be moving (laughs) when they do throw a ball or throw a pitch or whatever. Um, There's a lot of planes of movement. So I would encourage you to explore as many planes of movement as possible. Don't just get into this crunch pathway. Don't only do abdominal flexion. For, oh, please, 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 please mix it up, please spice it up, do a lot of variety within that. And then the full body exercise, kind of that open category at the very end, just have fun with it. Have fun with it. Make it something that's interesting for them, that excites them. Ask them if they know like what everything in the gym is. I do this all the time. As I'll ask a client, be like, is there anything in the gym that you look at and you're like, what the hell is that? 
<laughs> I want to teach that to you because I want people to feel comfortable in the gym. The more people know, the more they feel familiar with what's in the gym, the more comfortable they are. So that can be really fun. Uh, also, you as a trainer, let's say you want to learn more how to use like a landmine. Well, then all of a sudden, you're putting landmine in all your clients' programs. And this would be a great place to put it. You can play with different experiments, like different movements, different combinations. They're going to love it because it's something fun and new for them. Uh, you get to learn from it. So there's a lot of even personalization in regards to the trainer themselves. Is what do you want to learn more about? Select that and try to put that into your clients' programs as often as you can as it fits for each individual need. But this is the stuff that I absolutely love. This is kind of like my sweet spot is thinking of exercise selection and specificity for each individual. I love, 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 love the mental game of trying to pinpoint to the exact literal best exercise. I've talked about it before where the to write programs for my clients, I have a Microsoft Word document that has an exercise name and then a video, a t- video tutorial taken from YouTube. Right now, that document is 311 pages and there's an average of 18 exercises per page. Can't do that math in my head. 311 times 18, whatever that is. That's how many exercises I select from to write my clients' programs. And I'm adding in new exercises every single week. I just hit Control F. And I know when I think through the client, I'm like, okay, I want them to do a shoulder drill. We did these things last month. I know that this next area of focus is something that they've really been wanting to work on. How can I address this in a new way for that client? So I'll often do a lot of kind of new movements in order to introduce new challenges to help continue to progress the tissues, but also to keep them more mentally engaged and invested into the workouts. They tend to have a lot more fun when they're doing newish things. Not so new that they can never perfect it, never learn it, and always feel like they're confused and uncertain of what they're doing, but new enough that it's not the same three exercises done for you know six to nine months so that would be an encouragement that i would make for the trainer is to use a lot of exercise selection use the strategies here this structure so that way you don't get lost trying to figure out exercise nuances but miss big elements so use these structures and then try to think of how to personalize that structure per client and just have fun with it If anything, just have fun, experiment, talk with them. You know, even say, hey, this is a pretty new movement for me. I've done it. I love it. I thought you might like it. Let's go through it together. I've done that an infinite number of times for clients, and they always enjoy it. If you're excited, you're motivated, you're fired up, and you can teach it, and you know what they're going to feel. So make sure you only teach movements you've actually done. But you know what they're going to feel. You can talk them through it. You can teach them through it, and it's a great opportunity for both of you to learn. So I thought that was fun. Hopefully that was an interesting podcast. If you need anything, any help at all, let me know. On our website, you can check out the different services we have. One of the services that I don't talk about much, but it does like connect with today's podcast, is our ghost programming. So if you went to our website, you could see that uh, we have what's called ghost programming service where four other trainers I'll actually like jump in I'll write the program for their client but their client doesn't know it that's the ghost part so the trainer will reach out and say hey I have a client shoulder problem aging population I don't really know exactly what's the right thing to do for them I'm like don't worry about it I'll write them either uh, one up to three months of programming but with a template as well and then the trainer teaches based on that template with the exact exercises I provide and then within a month up to three months they learn how to plug and play different movements and then they take that structure and they run with it on their own they have that structure for the rest of their life and they get that educational component so I really love that it's one of my favorite things I get to do and you can learn more about that if you'd like on our website www.birdlinergym.com okay So hopefully today's podcast was interesting. I think this stuff is fun. If you need anything at all, please reach out. Again, you can always message me from our website, www.brutalirongym.com. 
If you like the podcast, please share the podcast. If you like the podcast, please consider donating to support the podcast, which you can do on our website. Also, if you like the information we share in the podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels. You can find us and follow us on Instagram and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Jim. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.